You're listening to Under the Shell Podcast, the best in America. Welcome to Under the Shell, presented by Testudo Times. I'm Brennan Weissel. Sam Jane, we back, baby. Michael Howes. All right, guys. I mean, it's sad to say, but Maryland basketball season is officially over. And to help flip from the parquet to the diamond, we welcome first-year Maryland softball coach, Lauren Karn. So let's kind of start with, I guess, the most pressing thing. Obviously, you've been on the Maryland job now for couple weeks um, in season, but uh, let's go back to, to when you took the job in the summer. What kind of led to that and, and why did you decide to leave Oakland? Yeah, so um, there were both personal and professional reasons for making the move. Um, we'll start with the professional ones. Uh, having the opportunity to coach in the Big Ten at a school like Maryland um, is really special. It's something that I think softball specifically, like the coaching group in the Big Ten is amazing, um, really supportive, and just a group of really strong women who are fighting for all the right things while competing for championships and World Series and all of that good stuff. So um, being able to just compete in the arena more often with coaches like that is awesome. Coming to the University of Maryland um, has been really special. So through the interview process, I found out that really everybody here, so like our administration, our support staff, other coaches, the student athletes, the Maryland pride that everybody has is really special and you feel it as soon as you talk to them. Um, And then the support that they have for each other within the department is amazing. And so all of those things came through in the interview process. And I thought this is somewhere where I could really see myself fitting in really well, doing really well, having the resources that I need to compete at a really high level. And then Personally, um, my husband and I slowly moved further and further west in our careers from both of our families. And um, we started our family in Michigan. And so we have a a soon to be four and two year old. And our goal since having them was to always get a little bit closer to home so they could just spend more time with their grandparents. Um, Because sadly, we don't have enough time with our grandparents. (laughs) So, when this opportunity came, it was kind of like a no brainer. I'm going to go for it, give it everything I got. And then from there, see where, where everything falls. Do you remember what your reaction was and how you found out you got the job? Yes. Um, I received a phone call from Damon and didn't know which way it was going to go, but I knew a phone call was coming at some point, um, in that week. And I just remember thinking, oh my God, like, I, I can't believe this. Um, like what a dream come true for me. And I just started crying on the phone. Uh, (laughs) I was just really excited and excited to call my husband, um, which then turned into a lot of other emotions, like us both leaving programs that we had built, but, um, just like excited tears. And then just like really excited to tell my family who, I didn't let them all know about the interview process. So like my parents didn't even know that um, I was going through the process because I didn't want them to be let down just in case (laughs) it didn't work out. Um, So it was really cool to be able to surprise them also. What has the transition kind of been like going from a smaller Midwest school to now a massive Big Ten program here at Maryland? What's some Mm -hmm. of the challenges you might have seen and maybe what's kind of easier? I'll start with the easier piece. And we just have more resources here. Um, We have more people in place to do a lot of things that take that off of my plate. So it allows me to coach a little bit more than maybe I had the space to do at Oakland because I was just wearing a couple more hats at Oakland. Um, But overall, like for me, it's about the people and taking care of our team, taking care of our girls. And I don't feel any differently about that moving from, you know, a smaller program to a bigger program. Um, So all of that has felt the same. Um, And I would say the biggest challenge is just getting the team to to live in the space that I hope that they can live and compete in, which is just a really positive, supportive um, atmosphere. And we're still adjusting to that. If we can kind of take it back to, I guess, 2008, um, when you finished your playing career, what kind of went into wanting to become um, assistant coach or like, was that something you always wanted to do? Kind of take us through the process of, you know, your mind and when you went into coaching. Yeah. So um, it was, I went into school wanting to be a math teacher. 
And so as a math education major, I quickly found out um, I, I didn't want to go that route. I didn't want to be a teacher. And it was one of those things where everybody told me growing up, I'd be a great teacher. You'd be a great teacher. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I guess I should be a teacher. Um, and then I thought, I really enjoy writing. I really enjoy journalism. Um, so I decided to change my major to um, English with a specialty in journalism. And um, at that point in time, my the coach that I graduated with had been hired. And she was just a little bit more open about like the coaching profession and what she was doing and that it could be full time. And it had been her career. And I thought, what? You can, you can do coaching like as a full-time job. I, I, that had never really crossed my mind before. Um, and so through talking to her, I thought that is something that I'm really interested in. If not, I really like sports journalism, so I'll figure that out. Um, and so I just kind of, after playing thought, if I'm going to do it, I need to try to do it right now. Um, see if I like it, see how it goes. And then I just never stopped. Kind of taking it back even a little bit further. We've talked about your coaching, but what we haven't talked about yet is your playing career. Kind of what I've seen so far is that you were kind of a star at St. Joseph's. Um, for the listeners, she threw one of only two perfect games in program history. I guess can you kind of describe that game, how that was going on. Um, I believe that was against Lafayette, if I'm correct. I, You might be right. I, I don't remember. Um, and I, I still am not, but was not somebody who was like really big on stats. I never looked at my stats. I never really paid attention to the records. Um, our SID would kind of let our coaches know when we would be close. Um, but I think the more that I would think about those things, because it happened in high school too, it was like, I was just waiting for it to be over to then just be able to play. And, um, so I never really wanted to know those things. So in that game, I knew I was close. I remember knowing I was close, but I didn't know what strikeout was going to be. Um, and so I did have a very good playing career. Um, but I think it was like the things that I remember most of my playing career aren't those moments. It's more like, I remember being at the A-10 championships and I wasn't playing my best, but there was a pitcher under me who, younger than me, who was doing much better than I was. And so, um, like, I remember having meetings with my team about rallying around each other and getting each other to try to win the championship and not necessarily focus on, like, what I was doing personally. I want to go back to what you just said about kind of statistics and knowing that. Is that something you still kind of believe as a coach now? Um, or is that just kind of as a player, the mental side of it? Um, it is something that I don't really think about as a coach too. Like I look at the stats because we have to do some, um, looking at that stuff just to make sure we're putting ourselves in the best possible position to win games. But I am not really like, I'm not focused on the stats. I go a lot off of feel. Um, I go a lot off of like the way the game is moving and what we think would be a better matchup based on who we think we're going to be facing. Um, so while I look at the stats, I'm not looking at them in depth. I'm not over analyzing them. Uh, we, I'm not talking to the, to the players about them. Um, and I know last night after the game, someone, one of the reporters asked a question about, um, the second pitcher for UVA who uh, had a low ERA and one of the second lowest in the country, I think he said, which I did not know that at the time <laughs> because that's not my focus. My focus is what pitches does she throw uh, and how can we hit them? That's all. In a sport like softball and, and baseball, you know, stats and not just like your typical ERA stats, but, you know, they, mm -hmm. it's blossomed into stuff like spin rate and, you know, making an exit velocity um, and stuff like that. How do you do you ever feel like worried that you're missing out on like crucial data or anything like that? Because there are a lot of coaches, I think, who are of your mindset of like, I can't pay attention to all it. And then there are some like new school coaches that that's a lot of what they rely on the analytics, that type. Do you, like what? How do you balance in? Do you ever think like, oh, maybe I need to be paying more attention? So when I say stats, I mean, like the record breaking things and like um, what you would see like gotcha. what anybody would be able to Google, but we're using, we're using the analytics. Like we okay. have a spray check. We're doing all of those things. Um, so I think it's more about like, for me, the analytics side is more what's happening in the moment um, and what's real and the stats, like 
the stats that like our girls might look at, they're just looking at their batting average and um, not digging deeper into their on-base percentage or their quality at bat percentage. And so to me, those stats don't tell the whole story. Uh, so I re- I don't focus on them. Like if some if somebody has the second best ERA in the country, that is amazing for that person. And obviously she's doing a great job for her team, but we still have to find a way to hit it. Um, and so just not really like bogging myself, my staff, or my team down with some of those things that are, I guess what you would call flashy um, and staying focused on the things that can help us be productive. So I got a hypothetical scenario for you just to kind of get inside the mind of Coach Karn. So say it's like, you know, the sixth inning in a 2-1 game that you guys are winning and you're your pitcher's been, your starter's been, you know, Courtney Weish has been in the game, uh, you know, but is at a really high pitch count and there's a runner on first and the analytics say that this, you know, this lefty is, is hits her, hits, you know, hits righties really, really well, but Mm -hmm. struggles against like Mm left-handers or left throwers. I don't know how, what's the pronunciation? Yeah. Yeah. Left-handed pitchers. Yep. Okay. Are you going to the bullpen? Are you taking that all into account? Or are you just seeing like, hey, she's pitched really, really well this game. I'm going to let her finish this inning. And I think that's super interesting to kind of mm-hmm. get inside the mind. I'm going off of feel there. I'm going off of how that person had at bats against her um, earlier in the game, what they looked like. Um, and I'm trusting, I'm trusting Courtney in that moment. Right. Um, and so – now it it would be different if in the inning before she had given up three, even if it was a one, two, three inning, but it was like line out, line out, deep fly ball. Then I'm like, okay, maybe she's starting to flat flatten out. So like that is telling me that she isn't throwing her best stuff. Um, so it really, I'm not going to lean on analytics too much there. I'm going to, I'm going to trust my gut on that one. Sometimes yeah. it's right. Sometimes it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay Rays fans probably wish that you were her manager. So, or the manager, so. <laughs> um, I want to ask about when you when you got to College Park. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what did what was your reactions when you first got like to the campus about finding some of the players who stood out, and you know what did you learn about the previous situation when you got here? Yeah. Um, so I just found out that. Um, our team is capable, the current players are capable of a lot of having a lot of success. They have, they had to learn how to fail and learn from a failure. They had to learn how to be okay making mistakes um, and not be embarrassed or upset by it. And we are really working to create that space. And I think we're finally getting as close to that space as we might be able to get to. Um, but it that was probably the biggest thing for me is like, okay, allow them to make mistakes, get them comfortable making mistakes. So then they can go out and just play as hard as they can. And if they make a mistake there, then they know it's okay. Um, because we, we were being really safe, I guess you could say, and not wanting to – be aggressive in making our outs, um, getting lead runners out, attempting to get lead runners out and, um, you know, not swinging early in counts or check swinging because we're second guessing ourselves, And so getting them comfortable in just like going all out at a hundred percent and then just, you know, let the chips fall where they may from there. Um, but don't go down without giving it everything. So that was the biggest thing. And then a couple of people who stood out who I think, very easily stand out. Um, even if you come to our games are people like Courtney and diamond, um, and Jada and Meg. And then the people that I think have really stepped their game up recently, um, are people like Sammy and Mick and Maisie. Um, and then Delaney behind the plate is doing a really good job for us. And that wasn't necessarily a role that she came in expecting. So a lot of people are kind of shining bright in the right moments. By the time this episode comes out, I'm pretty sure you guys will have already started um, Big Ten play. So kind of give us a look at how you think you're, you're going to fare in, in Big Ten play. I know you um, whatever have played, I think, like about 20 games so far mm-hmm. in the season uh, at the time of this recording. So um, just kind of how are you generally feeling going into the Big Ten and, you know, 
you mentioned coming to a Big Ten school, something super exciting for you. So yeah, I think I think we're at the right spot. Um, and going into playing our best softball, going into Big Ten play. And that's what we've talked about. Like before any game started, we talked about what we do in this, you know, preseason training sets us up for preseason. What we do in this pre-conference a uh, series of games sets us up for conference. And then that's where we've already ironed out all of our stuff. We figured out what our um, best combinations are offensively and defensively. And then we're just rolling through big 10 and we're feeling good and we're playing good. And that's, we're getting there. I think after this weekend, um, it's going to be a good opportunity for more people to just get more at bats, figure out their adjustments, uh, more pitchers to get innings, and then feel good going into Big Ten. So where we will fall, I'm not sure. Um, but what I do know is we're getting to the point where we're going to compete, and then we are also now believing that we can come back late in games, which is huge for us. I know it's kind of affected a bunch of other sports, but how have you seen the NCAA's stance and the new stance on the transfer portal kind of affect softball? Um, I think it's kind of gone the same across the board, like for college athletics, every coach that I talk to in different sports at different schools, um, they're all kind of saying the same thing. And now with, you know, including NIL with the transfer portal, um, I think we're just, it's a new age of college athletics and we have to learn to adapt and, um, We have to try to recruit student athletes who want to be at Maryland for very specific reasons to be able to retain them. Um, Because if they do really well, they might have other opportunities. And that's just kind of the facts of the world right now. Yeah. So like I know Jada McFarlane, um, like covering it last year, had had some options from different teams. Mm -hmm. Was it almost like you had to re-recruit her because you're a new coach and she has these different offers and stuff like that. How do you like go about recruiting players on your own team. And I'm assuming that you probably had to do that in Oakland too, where bigger schools might come and try Mm -hmm. to like poach them from your roster. And did you ever have a player just like leave and there's like, there's nothing we can do? Uh, I haven't experienced that yet. And Jada, I think had made her decision prior to my arrival because I was, I had arrived so late. Um, And I think I feel really strongly that in order to set student athletes up for success, you have to allow them to be where they want to be. And so if somebody really wants to be somewhere else, then um, I'm going to have to allow them to do that. And then my next move is how do we replace that? Instead of kind of wallowing in what could have or should have been, we can't, I can't control those things. But my goal is to create an environment where they want to stay. They want to get this degree. They value what we're doing here. They value, um, the space that they're playing in and the level of success that they can have over maybe some other things. And from there, I can't control, I can't control everything. One thing you can't control either is the replay review system. Um, Mm -hmm. I did, uh, like I was, I was kind of interested because I remember last year they played non-conference games and there would be review and then they'd come home into one of the biggest conferences in the country and there'd be no review What do you know about the replay system? What do you think about it? Because I know the previous coach was not happy necessarily with Mm -hmm. um, how things went down in the Big Ten. I mean, I think it's there are pros and cons to everything, especially when something changes within the sport. Um, I think it's been pretty good. I they've allowed more things to be reviewable, and. I think that helps the game. I think the fact that there's a limit on our reviews and we don't get them back like football uh, also (laughs) helps. Um, But it does, it changes the game because you're taking the, the human piece out of it and we're relying on um, technology, robots, all of those things. Um, And then the fact that we don't have it at home, I think it's just like, eventually we're all going to have it. And so worrying about like what we don't have right now, we can't do that because the team whether we have it or not, wherever we're playing, our opponent has the same opportunity to either use it or not use it. Um, so to me, it's just kind of like, it depends on where you're playing, but I do think it's good for the game. An interesting tidbit that I read about you is that while at um, Oakland, you started to let pitchers and catchers call their own game. Mm-hmm. Um, is that a normal thing? Um, and is that something you brought here? And then how did you kind of make that decision to allow them to do that? 
Yeah. So um, I guess it depends on how you define normal. <laughs> um, for me, I think that's the best flow of the game. I think the pitchers and catchers um, should be in sync with each other and they see things differently, obviously, as a battery than I can see from the sideline. Um, I can get information, gather information, but I can't see everything. And so at Oakland, um, our pitcher and catcher had a really special bond. And it was right after we had been practicing our catcher calling the game um, within scrimmages, in fall ball, and um, in bullpens. And so uh, I think I had COVID. And so I was out for a weekend series. And I was like, you're going to take it, go for it. And so she did a great job, which I was not surprised by because it's something we had been practicing over and over again. Then I came back and we were kind of going back and forth between me calling and her calling. And the pitchers just really liked the flow of the game. They felt like they were a lot more focused on the field of play instead of taking their eyes off of the field of play for signals. Um, They liked the flow of the game better. So we stuck with that and she's been calling pitches ever since there. Um, here, so Delaney did call pitches, um, in the fall and, um, it's something that I would like to get to, because again, I feel like the flow of the game is just so much better. I think it's just more like they are in control of what they're doing. And ultimately that's what I want them to do is be in control of what they're doing, uh, be an active participant in both their success and their failure. So they can get better from both of those things. Um, and not have it be like, okay, you know, my coach told me to throw a curveball, so I have to throw a curveball right here. I talk a lot about like throwing into windows and the top of the window and the bottom of the window and in and out of the zone and competitive pitches. And I think that just takes, it takes time to learn. There's a learning curve to that. Um, so eventually I would like to get to, to that spot, but I think it's all about personnel. And I know specifically Courtney, the way she gets her timing on the mound, she likes to look in get her signal, look back out. Um, because we also toyed with, I give the catcher the signal and the catcher relays it to the pitcher, but she likes the flow better when she's looking in. So it's all kind of personal preference. Is that something you had been thinking about? Like, do you think that ever would have happened in your coaching career if you hadn't got COVID or, um, would you ever got to that point? Okay. (laughs) Yeah, I do. Cause we had been practicing it. We've been working on it and it was, um, specifically that catcher, a goal of hers as a freshman. So as a freshman, she didn't call the game, but from sophomore year on, she did. And um, it had been a goal of hers and she studied it and um, really came back as a sophomore, just like, I'm ready to do this. Let me do this. I got this. (laughs) Uh, So it was kind of like one of her goals. And I was like, well, let's, let's do it. And now I'm, I've realized it, makes the flow of the game a lot better. You mentioned earlier how I think you said your husband uh, also left a program. What was he up to before um, kind of moved to the East Coast and what's he up to now? Yeah. So he was um, a college baseball coach. He was a head coach in the NAIA at Madonna University. And he had just come off of a conference championship and uh, back-to-back appearances in the regional Um, so he's had a lot of success in his career. He's, he's also, uh, the pitching coordinator for the USPBL, which is, um, an independent professional baseball league in the summer in Michigan. And right now he's stay at home dad, um, taking care of the kids. And so that's been a really big adjustment because he went from preparing for his team to return and hopefully win a championship to we have to leave. And, uh, that, that has been a big adjustment for our family because he's a baseball guy through and through. Right on. Is your kind of conversations at home, you know, you guys talk a lot about baseball and softball or kind of something you, um, I mean, obviously it's something you guys definitely have in common, but is it, um, you guys talk about that a lot or is it something you kind of just leave at work? Um, combination. It depends on what's going on. Um, like randomly he'll be watching our games and I'll come home and be like, what were you doing there? Or like, this kid looks like she's doing X, Y, and Z. And like, what are you guys working on? Um, he's a really, he's really good at his job. So anytime he sees something like, Oh, I didn't look at it that way. So I'm going to take it into the office the next day. Um, and for me, like when he, when he was coaching last year, which I'm hoping he gets another opportunity to do that on the East coast. Um, it was like, I feel like I helped him a little bit more in the, um, how to change his mindset when he's like approaching a situation with his team compared to like, 
helping him with baseball things. <laughs> right on. Well, those are all the, the questions I had. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, no problem. Thank uh, you for having me. Lauren, thank you very much for joining us. And before we fully close the book on basketball season, we have to talk about how the men's season and how the women's season ended, right, guys? Most definitely. Definitely got to chat a little bit about March, which one team made and one team didn't. Um, I guess they both made March, but but neither uh, one did not make the postseason. We'll talk about them first. The men's team, um, we'll just do some quick hitters, I think, guys, just to kind of refresh everybody. Um, lost to Wisconsin in the second round of the Big Ten tournament. Um, they ended up rejecting the NIT, which I think makes sense. I mean, um, you know, other than getting Deshaun Harris Smith like reps without Jameer Young, it, this team looked like we talked about it, guys. They looked done in the water, kind of. Um, so I think that made sense. Um, but some big additions or big addition, I guess you could say, both on the coaching staff and on the court. Mike Rodney Rice coming in, uh, transfer. Um, former Virginia Tech player, highly recruited, um, you know, guard wing type um, that Kevin Willard decided to bring in. He spent three years at DeMatha um, and then committed to Virginia Tech, um, played just eight games during his freshman year, um, and recently entered the transfer portal, uh, according to the Diamondbacks. So what do you guys think of the addition? I kind of like it like a, it seems like a low floor or low floor, high ceiling type of type of offer, but I think it's good to get some depth in there. It's good. It's worth keeping in mind he's not with Virginia Tech for a reason. So fans expect him to be this extraordinary transfer portal addition. He's likely not going to be that. Um, Just kind of touching on rejecting the NIT a little bit. Not surprised with that. Um, Just kind of, you know, three players have already transferred. A couple others are, you know, still thinking about their future with the Terps. It just wasn't they did not want to play more basketball games. They were ready for that long, miserable season to end. They were done with it. They wanted no more time on the court. Yeah, Mike, I think the only sad thing about rejecting the NIT is that Jameer Young's career kind of just ends on a very weird note with a ridiculous blowout loss to Wisconsin. In terms of um, Rice transferring in, he obviously didn't play this past season at Virginia Tech. It's not exactly clear why that happened. So, you know, it's exciting transfer. I, I thought he wasn't actually going to come to Maryland because his coach at DeMatha, Mike Jones, went to Old Dominion. I kind of had a feeling after Mike Jones went that um, Rodney Rice, a person that Maryland had their eyes on for probably a while since he wasn't playing at Virginia Tech, was going to go there. But whatever, comes to Maryland. And uh, it's totally a player that you don't really know about. He hasn't stepped on a college basketball court in by the time he's playing in two years. So we'll have to see what, what he brings to the table and kind of uh, who else is with him is probably the biggest question, like you said, Mike. I really like the Belmont guard um, that they've been, they've been bringing in. I watched some YouTube highlights of him kind of looks like exactly the type of player they needed this year. Um, but I think him and DHS, if, if they're able to get him. Guys, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, Jacoby Gillespie, that's what it was. Um, we'll have to see who transfers in because we already know some people have transferred out. Um, Noah Batchelor, um, Jonathan Lamoth, and Callum Swanton Rogers all left the program. Um, Noah Batchelor already committed, right? Buffalo, I think it was. Um, so that was a quick turnaround. Uh, but I don't think, you know, no offense to those guys. I don't really think any of them will be missed necessarily, um, on this roster. So, uh, yeah, they, they, this is the off season, right? This is the new age of college basketball. A lot of players cycle in, a lot of players cycle out and the same extends to coaches, right? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. With, you know, coach coming in, Kevin Norris from UCF, um, kind of Baltimore native type, type of guy. And it's doing exactly what Mike Jones um, and Tony Skim were here to do. So that hire totally makes sense. And I was not surprised at all to see Willard was bringing in um, a local guy. In this day and age, though, I don't really think it matters trying to keep local talent in state by having local coaches. It it all comes down to NIL. We're going to talk about it in a few minutes. But I think that's why both the men's and women's team have struggled recently is that Maryland does not have the facilities one compared to other major schools, and then the NIL money too. That's what I think the issue lies. I don't know if I agree with coaching. Having local coaches doesn't matter. I mean, having people they're familiar with. I mean, I thought Mike Jones when he came to Maryland was a great hire. Obviously, he left, but having you know, couldn't, the get, his coach, high school, couldn't get his own high school player. I mean, that is very true, but you would think the idea of it would help. Sam, what are your thoughts on that? 
I think Derek Queen committed here because the NIL situation was great. That's my my opinion. I think guys like staying close to home still, no matter what age of college basketball we play in. Familiarity and comfortability always matters. So I would agree with Brendan. I think I agree. I do understand what Mike's trying to say in that, like, a lot of times it's just the biggest offer. But I think that having you know, someone who a player is familiar and comfortable with still goes a long way. So I thought it was a good hire, good replacement hire for Mike Jones, especially. I don't know if you need two of those type of guys, but since Jones left, I thought bringing him in was a good idea. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think the men's basketball news will probably just be stuff about the transfer portal um, from here on out. Yeah, and I think that both teams, the men and the women's, are going to be looking deep into the transfer portal. We'll touch on the women's side now. Uh, They did play a tournament game. And it was an absolutely bonkers one. Lost to Iowa State and Audie Crooks. 20-point lead. I think it's the second largest women's basketball tournament lead that that they ended up blowing. Um, They just couldn't stop anybody inside. Uh, Audie Crooks just absolutely dominated. And the Terp season ended the way that I kind of thought it would, right? They don't have any post presence. And they weren't able to guard, you know, one of the best post players in the country. I, I watched that game pretty closely. I'm not sure that game was ever close, actually. It was. It kind of looked like Maryland was going to run away with the game. And then as soon as Iowa State started bringing that game back, I don't think it was ever close again. It was pretty clear that Maryland was going to lose that game after Iowa State in the third quarter just couldn't stop scoring. Yeah, and it showed one of their glaring weaknesses all season where it didn't have that true center, that true interior presence. You know, Crooks took over in the second half, absolutely dominated Maryland, 40 points. Was that that was a uh, her career high, right? And then you know after the loss, we kind of look towards next season. Obviously, you're not going to have Brene Alexander. You're not going to have Lavender Briggs, Faith Masonis, Sam. I don't know if you know they're expecting her to be back or not. I know she has one year of eligibility left. But then the returners, you got Bree McDaniel, Shy Sellers, Ali Quebec. Emily Fisher, I can see all four of those being in the starting lineup and then having to transfer, take that fifth spot. You also get Riley Nelson coming back from her injury and then three top 50 freshmen to round it out. So, yeah, transfer portal is going to play a factor in next year's roster. I've heard some inklings that they're already on the lookout. Position-wise, what is it? Is it guards? Because I know, you know point guard was an issue. Center also was an issue. I don't know the player, but I do know that they're actively – um, involved with somebody. So I, it's clear they've already moved on to next season. I think Brenda is not – I really don't think that Brenda's going to let the lack of depth happen again. Like it seemed like she talked about it every post game. We had a lack of depth. We had a lack of depth. We had a lack of depth. It seems like that's not going to happen again. So I would expect them to bring in a decent amount of bodies from the portal for sure. Um, it'll be an interesting off season for sure, and we'll have to see what Freeze does. This is kind of the first time she's had a – you know, first time they've lost in the first round since she took over. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how they bounce back for sure. Uh, interesting season nonetheless. Um, definitely ended out kind of kind of a weird ending. Um, but they did lose. So has the men's lacrosse team. Fizzled out definitely. They have not won a game since we last recorded. Um, lost to UVA and then lost to Michigan. Again, um, I think that sits fresh in everyone's mind, the Big Ten Championship last year. Brendan, what's happening with this team, man? For some reason, they can't figure Michigan out. I don't know. Do you guys think I cursed them? So last year, I like to do this where I look back at, you know, how Maryland has historically played against certain teams, help provide some context. And Michigan historically, men's lacrosse in the Big Ten, pretty bad. But the past three years, pretty darn good. In the last, I guess, year against Maryland. They're 3-0, and and before that, um, Maryland was 10-0. and So Maryland has lost the last three, and I mentioned that on the podcast last year, and, you know, Maryland hasn't won since then. So who knows? It was, you know, it was, their, it was a closer game than either of the two they played last year, but um, it kind of goes back to what I, I was talking about in the other two games where, like, turnovers and starting slow is not the way this team is going to win games. And against Michigan, that is pretty much exactly what happened and McNaney really hasn't been himself and himself. The issue is that the way, you know, Terps fans have the idea of him playing was two seasons ago um, when he was at his high in Maryland, didn't lose any games, but a lot of that was helped by the the defense in front of him. And he's coming back from an ACL injury. So it's hard to, or a knee injury. It's hard to say, you know, 
that would be back at the form. He obviously isn't moving that much. He's in goal, but took a whole season off from college across with the exception of the first few games. And, you know, he just hasn't been, hasn't been where he was two, two seasons ago. Yeah, I don't know what to think of this, like what this stretch, because I think on one hand you can't overreact and, and you know, fall the team for losing to the number three team in the country and then by one goal to, you know, a team they struggled with as Brendan outlined. But on the other hand, McNanny's, you know, struggles haven't been great. They still haven't found that go-to score. And, um, you know, I watched some of the Virginia game, the highlights, and just a lot of like missed opportunities at, at the net, um, it looked like. And scoring conversion rates got to be higher. Um, so I think that... You know, this team, um, I don't think it's time to panic, but definitely something to pay attention to over the next couple of weeks. Um, and as they kind of move forward here, Brendan, um, with their season, what do, what do we got coming up for the men's lacrosse team? Yeah, Sam, next up is going to be Penn State. Maryland's going to Penn State. And Penn State's had a very solid season. Haven't faced too much um, tough competition yet. They're 7-1 and 1-0 and, and one and oh in Big Ten play with a win against Ohio State. But this is a game Maryland absolutely needs to win. There's no question. Um, Maryland has to come away with the win in this, this game, and I'm pretty sure they know that, and they'll be assuming that they'll be um, focused on that game coming up, but it's hard to know how Maryland's going to do. I mean, we've seen them beat some of the best teams in the country and barely beat uh, Brown, which is one of the worst teams, so it's really hard to know. Yeah, and I think that you just got to pay attention here over these next couple of weeks, and we'll keep paying attention to them. We'll keep paying attention to the women's lacrosse team, because they sit up top of the rankings now, guys. Number one team in the country. Is that the first time we've had a number one team in the country in College Park? When would the last team have been? While we've been here? Yeah. Um, I guess so. Unless, I think either, it might be. Did field hockey get there, Mike, freshman year? I think it might have been number one for a week or two last season, if I can recall. Yeah. I know men's soccer was, was very close, if not. They were but never, They were never the top never team. Won. So, yeah. I mean, Damn. here we have it. Number one team number- in the country. Um, flip back. Too. Yeah. Quick look back. Uh, they've won three uh, pretty easy games going back two weeks since we recorded to Rutgers, Georgetown, and Ohio State. Won't spend much time on them. Got game of the day this comes out on Wednesday against Penn. Penn is a, a very, very good team, and their only loss is to Michigan, who Maryland is playing on Saturday. Um, just like I was talking about, Maryland is 27 and 2 all time against Penn and haven't lost since. 2007, but Penn, 14th best team in the country, very defensive team, could absolutely give Maryland run for their money. But, you know, Maryland's the number one team in the country. Michigan is the second best team in the country. And honestly, they should probably be ranked the number one team in the country because they're undefeated. Um, Maryland had one loss to Florida in a game they pretty much dominated. But still, I mean, you know, Michigan's undefeated. They're very clearly one of the best teams in the country. I said it about the men's team last year, so I kind of hesitate to say it, right? But Maryland has never lost to Michigan, but also Michigan's never been this good, and Michigan's never been the second best team in the country. In fact, Maryland's never even played a game against Michigan that's within three goals. So Maryland's historically been the dominant team, but Michigan is very solid this year, and that all comes down to their defense, averaging 5.7 goals per, per game. That is going to be a tough test. Their goalie, Aaron O'Grady, is 652 save percentage, which is very, very good. Anything above 500 is very solid and, and probably one of the highest in the country. So going to be a huge test on offense for Maryland, and it's going to be a super exciting game to watch. I do think some of those numbers are a little inflated by playing like Central Michigan, Colorado. You know, uh, they played I – mean, Denver's okay, right, Brendan? But Cincinnati, Jacksonville. Denver's games very against- solid. Denver's solid, yeah. But recently, they gave up 11 goals to Marquette, 10 goals to Rutgers. They only gave up five to Penn. But there are holes to be exploited in this defense, I think. Um, and Maryland has the offensive talent to do it. So I think that I think I like Maryland in this one. I'm not going to lie. I think they're going to keep up the keep up the hot streak. But I think it's going to be an excellent game, really tight knit, and they're going to have to convert on goals for sure. Um, you know, the, as this team moves forward, that's going to be the big thing. Are they? You know, is this an elite shooting team? I don't think we're yet to see, but they're clearly one of the nation's best, and um, it'll be really fun to watch them progress throughout the season um, as we as we move through here into Big Ten play. Um, as we go from you know those those two sports, we'll, we'll retouch on a winter sport. The wrestling team um, didn't really have a great showing. All five wrestlers 
uh, lost their first round matchups. Nobody placed. Um, but the player who had the lowest rank ranking for the Terps had actually the best performance. Um, Seth Nevels uh, had scored four points um, at nationals and, you know, pulled through, but another, another kind of, you know, middle of the pack, bottom of the pack finish for the Terps finished 36th. Um, so uh, not necessarily what you're looking for. Another middle of the pack team somewhat this season, the softball team, they're 15 and 15 right now. Did have a good interview of coach Karn though. One of the things that I guess really st- stood out to me in that interview was when she talked about in her interview process to get the job, she noticed that the Maryland pride, you know, that's something that is brought up a lot. They show the videos at the basketball games. That's a real thing in the athletic department. A lot of people have that Maryland pride. Um, did you guys have any? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think like Karn said, I, I don't think she's unrealistic. She talked about building the culture. I thought really what was interesting was how she talked about how this team needs to learn to fail, right? Like she kept bringing that up about how last year's players maybe a pointed shot at Mark Montgomery that – you know, this they didn't really they were afraid to make a mistake and it's coaching that out of them. And I know, especially on the diamond, you're gonna make mistakes. It's probably one of the game that you make the most mess ups in, right? Um, so being able to instruct that and teach that I think is a super big learning point. Um, and if she can get that instilled, I think we could start to see um some more some more wins, especially when you have plays like Sammy Woods. I don't know if you guys saw a top ten uh diving diving play there. Uh, by the Maryland shortstop. So that was a definite highlight that came out of the weekend. Um, came out over, of the series three over Minnesota. Beat the Golden Gophers, so a nice Big Ten series win for sure for the Terps. Um, a baseball baseball team, they also got a series win. A little bit more dramatic fashion. How about ourselves? we got ourselves a little Braden Martin action. Back-to-back walk-offs. I mean, this freshman, you know, nephew of Walt Williams, now is becoming his own Terp legend. Mike, you were at all the games. You've been at almost all the games. How's this Terps team looking, man? Uh, Martin's performance just shows that he's he's just a piece of an extremely talented freshman class for the Terps right now. Um, at the time of we're recording this right now, uh, third baseman Chris Acopian, he's leading the team with six home runs. He's batting over 300. Jordan Crossland, outfielder, he added two other home runs to the season so far, also batting over 300. This is going to be a freshman class that in a few years we could be saying is better than the freshman class of Matt Shaw, Luke Schliger, Kevin Keister, and Jason Savakul, especially when you add in Joey McMahon as Sunday starter. Bold prediction, but look at this take in three years and see how it ages. Um, Kind of looking at it big picture-wise, though, they're number 35 in RPI right now. That's the second best in the Big Ten behind Nebraska who's ranked number 10. Kind of surprising because Maryland came away with a big win over a top 25 RPI team in James Madison. And then kind of going through the rankings, Maryland's not ranked right now. Nebraska's not ranked. No Big Ten Ten teams are ranked. Um, It's just kind of a testament to how, I guess, the Big Ten baseball conference is viewed on a national level, how they're still kind of behind the SEC, the ACC, even the Sun Belt Conference. Rightfully so. I mean, the Big Ten hasn't had a team make the national championship since Michigan, which was like eight years ago, seven years ago, um, something like that. But Chris Sokopian's getting some national attention. He made the freshman like All-American team I saw today. So super exciting team. And and the, the cardiac Terps, uh, they don't go away um, for sure. What do they got coming up here? Uh, you know, some series here in the upcoming week. So Tuesday after this is released, um, they're playing Georgetown. And then this weekend they're playing against Michigan, which is kind of a middle-of-the-pack Big Ten team. But can't really overestimate anybody because Michigan State wasn't really, you know, highly touted heading into the season, um, the series last weekend. But it did go to 10 innings and both of the Terps wins to get that series victory. Also, the 23rd straight series victory for Maryland, dating all the way back to 2021. Best program in the Big Ten, I think we can officially say, even if it's a mid-conference for baseball, um, for sure. But Braden Martin, uh, incredible, incredible performance for a freshman. And in honor of that, that's what our game will be this week, guys. We're going to have the best freshman seasons, performances uh, of this uh, of Maryland history. Um, so give me your guys' top three Maryland freshmen. Brendan, we can start with you. 
Wow, Sam, I never, ever start off a draft, usually because I have lost the previous one. So I really do appreciate that honor. And I'll keep it uh, right here in, in 2024 and 2023, I guess. Kamani Stewart Baines was a freshman on the men's soccer team last year. And he got drafted to the MLS. He's no longer at the University of Maryland. But Big Ten freshman of the year last year. Gonna, he's playing on the Colorado Rapids right now. And, you know, most interesting of all, brother is with Nikhil Harry, NFL wide receiver, kind of. So it's my first pick. I'll assume the second spot. Um, I remember watching this game. I'm going to take Diamond Stone in 2015. He scored 39 points against Penn State. And what was funny was that he came off the bench that game and he scored 39 points. Um, also grabbed 12 rebounds. And that was kind of a comeback against Nittany, Nittany, Nittany Lions. All right, I'm going to you know follow you guys up. Good couple picks there. I'm going to take um, you know Deshaun Harrison. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm going to take Melo Trimble. Um, really good freshman season, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go grab – Go grab me some mellow at the top of the draft, and then I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with um, former former guest of the team, just because of kind of coming in as a freshman and um, kind of changing the program. I'm gonna go Shea Duran for my next pick. I thought we were taking like individual games, so I was like looking back at all the game logs for these guys. Um, next one I'm gonna take is Joe Smith. So in 1994, this season he averaged 19 points was the ACC Rookie of the Year, ACC All-Freshman, All-ACC. He dropped 29 in the first round of the NCAA tournament. They made it to the Sweet 16 that year behind Joe Smith's efforts. Very good research there, Mike. A man after my own heart. Second pick, I'll take Corey Edmondson, currently a sophomore on the women's lacrosse team. Had a very solid season last year. And for my final pick, I will take the 1931 rifle champion, team champion in her freshman year, Irene Knox. TT, terrific turp, baby. For my last pick, uh, I also remember watching this one. Uh, Rakeem Jarrett in 2020, he had 144 yards against Penn State, two touchdowns that game. Um, Maryland got their win over Penn State that season. Um, doesn't matter that it was a COVID year, but really that was a performance that encapsulated what Terps fans expected him to be when he uh, committed to Maryland, uh, never really reached that level and that potential um, and those expectations as his career went on. I'm going to stick with soccer, go Joshua Bulma for my pick. Uh, one Big Ten freshman of the year, um, was the last player to win it since Kamani Stewart uh, Baines. So I'm going to give me, I, and I loved watching Bulma last year, so I have a personal connection to him. Uh, love me some Josh Bulma. Huge honorable mention, speaking of specific games for freshmen, Mike. Um, we talked about it earlier this year, one of the earliest episodes of the year, Jayshon Jones in the Ohio State game. Oh, I should have. Big no, honorable one. mention. Big honorable mention. <laughs> not Ohio State. Texas, Texas. 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 Rushing, he running, passing. Rushing, running. You're right. You're right. He dropped the game with Yes, him. yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, shout maybe out, that's – maybe I <laughs> – Shout out him for that game, too. Maybe I just remember that one more. You're absolutely right, though. Yeah, that was the – it was just like that first game, game or whatever. He was, he was wearing an Apple watch on the sideline or yeah, something, right? right? Yeah. Shout out one of my favorite guests, Jay Sean. Uh, that was a fun right one. On. We'll have to, maybe we'll terrific Terp Jay Sean Jones eventually, but that's not this week's terrific Terp. It's a different guy. His name, with, name starts with a with an, uh, similar letter to J, um, but it's a G, and it's a, it's a G of a terrific Terp, so give it to me, B. This week's Terrific Turp may have invented the spin move. Gene Shue was born in 1931 in Baltimore. Shue came to Maryland in 1950 because he got turned down by two other local options, Loyola and Georgetown. With that in mind, he came to College Park. When he arrived, Maryland basketball was in despair with only seven winning seasons in Shue's lifetime. He was not offered a scholarship at the school, so he worked some odd jobs to make some money, including cleaning the court. Finally, his senior year, he got a scholarship and he led Maryland to a 23-win season in their first year in the ACC. But she really made his mark in the professional game. First, as a player, he joined the NBA the same year that the shot clock did, which was 1954. He played in the NBA for 10 years with an impressive five-year and a row stint in the All-Star game. A few years after he stopped playing, he was behind the sidelines and back in the DMV as coach of the Bullets. Coached there for 13 total seasons with a short break in Philadelphia. He won NBA Coach of the Year twice, and he made the playoffs 10 times as a coach, but he was never able to get over the hump and win a championship. He made his return to basketball in his 80s 
to be the GM of the 76ers for a few years in the 1990s. But that would end his basketball career. She's been around the game for so many years, but it all started in College Park. So he is this week's Trevector. They're a fun one and a good episode to get us back from spring break. Um, no longer in balmy conditions here, at, here in Maryland. Um, but we're in spring sports season. Now that basketball and winter sports have officially wrapped up, we'll be able to spend a lot more time on baseball, the women's lacrosse, men's lacrosse. Um, so that'll be a lot of fun. And, and we have a lot of good teams. I think this is the best quality sports season for Maryland athletics for sure. So exciting times and under the shell, and you can find us at all places you get your podcast, Apple, Spotify, now YouTube as well, and get us on socials at Instagram and Twitter. Um, you can follow us on Testudo Times as well. But for, for everybody out there listening to this episode, I hope you had a wonderful spring break. If you're a college student and if you're an adult, enjoy March Madness. Don't hurt too much that the Terps aren't in it. Guess what? You've got Under the Shell Podcast. Nobody does it better.